This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. One often hears today that the Bible is riddled with errors, and so it cannot claim to be even an accurate history book, let alone a divine revelation. It's obviously true that any document plagued with factual errors has forfeited its right to be taken seriously on the spiritual level. Jesus himself referenced this issue when he said, If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Without a foundation in factual validity, a claim to spiritual truth is simply pathetic. We could, however, turn that assertion around. An ancient document that has been shown to be factually accurate throughout has at least won the right to be heard on higher subjects. And so, there is value to examining the Bible's claims on matters we can test, like geography, history, or physics. If it passes these, then it has won a right to be heard on what it says about God. Otherwise, not. And we close the book and go home. Take, for example, this historical claim about Judah's king Hezekiah. Quote, it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. Second Chronicles 32.30 A public works project of that sort ought to have left some traces that might still be found today. Come with me back to the 8th century BC and note the context of this claim. The 8th century is drawing to a close, and for King Hezekiah it probably seemed that his kingdom was too. The northern kingdom, Israel, was already gone, swept away by Shalmaneser and the dreaded Assyrians. Now, only twenty years later, the new king, Sennacherib, had his eyes on the southern kingdom of Judah and its monarch, Hezekiah. Meeting Assyria on the battlefield would be worse than foolish. Too many had tried that and been wiped out. But perhaps the Jews could hunker down in their walled cities like Lachish and Jerusalem and hold out until the Assyrians grew tired of the venture. After all, cities that were well supplied, fortified, and defended had often remained intact through years of such sieges. Jerusalem had strong walls and warriors to man them but she had one crucial weakness, water. Unlike many cities that were situated on rivers or lakes, Hezekiah's capital had only some natural springs, and one of the best ones, Gihon, was actually outside the city walls. Left as it was, it would be a fine source of water for the Assyrians, while Jerusalem grew ever more thirsty. But how could one protect it? If only there were some way to bring it inside the city, deny its water to the invaders, and add it to Jerusalem's scant supply. Then they might survive the Assyrian juggernaut. And Sennacherib came. Second Kings 18.13 tells us, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. One after another, the cities of Judah fell to the conqueror. His own record of the campaign says, quote, I besieged 46 of his fortified walled city and surrounding small towns which were without number, using packed down ramps and by applying battering rams, infantry attacks with mines, breaches, and siege machines, I conquered them. 
as Hezekiah watched. Even the second best fortified city in Judah, Lachish, fell to these siege tactics. Sennacherib was so proud of that triumph that he memorialized it in an enormous bas-relief in his palace. That relief, now in the British Museum, is eight feet high and eighty feet long. And after Lachish, Jerusalem was next. Second Kings 18 gives us a dramatic account of the siege of Jerusalem, which began with the demand for surrender. Quote, then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. That's 2 Kings 18, 28 and 29. Were the people of Jerusalem ready to resist? Well, King Hezekiah had used the time gained from the Assyrian attacks on the other cities, doing what he could to prepare. The fortifications and defenders were as ready as he could make them. Quote, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the supporting terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. That's Second Chronicles 32, 2 and 5. But of course, water supply was absolutely vital, both to provide for the defenders and to deny it to the invaders. Quote, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. Second Chronicles 32, 3 and 30. A channel like that might look something like this on a map, or perhaps more understandably like this on a cutaway model. So we come now to the subject of this talk. Did Hezekiah's workmen actually dig such a channel? It would have required them to tunnel under the city, cutting through the Dolomite bedrock, a hard stone and a dangerous task. But if you visit Jerusalem today, you can see the result of their work. Here's the entrance sign in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. Note that the tunnel is 530 meters long. That's almost six football fields in length. Down the stairs you go, properly dressed for the trek, and then you slog through the water. Most of us would not need the sign's admonition to avoid drinking the water en route. The tunnel's been known since 1865, but it wasn't until some years later that it could be established that it was indeed Hezekiah's work. Students found an inscription on the wall of the tunnel that documents the final effort. Quote, this is the account of the breakthrough. While the laborers were still working with their picks each toward the other, and while there were still three cubits to be broken through, the voice of each was heard through the rock, calling to the other, because there was a crack in the rock to the south and to the north. And at the moment of the breakthrough, the laborers struck each toward the other, pick against pick. Then the water flowed from the spring to the pool for 1,200 cubits, and the height of the rock above the heads of the laborers was 100 cubits." End quote. All in all, it was an amazing achievement, as this cutaway drawing illustrates. Done under great pressure of time, with the threat of invasion growing ever nearer, the workers 
actually tunneled from both ends in hope of meeting. They had to do a significant detour to avoid disturbing royal graves here, and we find evidence of them sometimes going wrong and having to recalibrate. And yet, somehow they managed to meet one another. Scholars are still debating how they achieved that. One theory is that they may have had workmen on the surface with something like sledgehammers attempting to guide them by sound. It was a monument to ingenuity, though. The tunnel, over 500 meters long, has a drop of only one foot for its entire length. So they blocked up the Gaihan Spring, denying it to the Assyrians, and channeled it into the city. But after all that work, how did it end? The siege of Lachish had ended with the utter destruction of a well-defended city. Was Sennacherib successful at Jerusalem? The Taylor Prism tells us this. As for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, forty-six of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, I besieged and took them. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem his royal city. Well, what an anticlimax to his arrogant account. What he does not say, presumably because he can't say it, is that he took the city and leveled it to the ground, leading Hezekiah off in chains. Those who read Second Kings know more about this. The Assyrian king had delivered a scornful and blasphemous letter to Hezekiah, which the king took to the temple and laid before the Lord, praying that he would see it and respond. Isaiah the prophet gave God's response, quote, Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. The scripture account goes on. That night... The angel of the Lord went out and put to death a hundred and eighty-five thousand men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib king of Assyria broke camp and withdrew. That's Second Kings nineteen thirty-two to thirty-six. This, of course, is the account from the Bible's perspective. A reader may wonder about this reference to a supernatural wave of death through the Assyrian army. But if something like that did not occur, then we must find some way to explain the unstoppable Assyrians' failure to take Jerusalem. And history does tell us, for good measure, that soon after his return to Nineveh, Sennacherib was assassinated by his own sons. What goes around comes around. Time then for a reality check on the Bible's account of this business. Archaeology has provided us with the key pieces of evidence to substantiate what Scripture has told us. Sennacherib did invade Judah, destroying many of its towns, and his armies did then surround Jerusalem. So says his own record of the campaign. There is to this day a tunnel from the Gihon Spring under the city of David supplying water to the pool of Siloam. That it was the work of Hezekiah's people is confirmed by the 8th century inscription found in the tunnel. And the Assyrians failed to take Jerusalem, 
providing a humiliating end to their campaign, as their own records show. We return then to the original question this talk posed. Can you trust what the Bible says about factual matters? Well, can you get your feet wet under Jerusalem? If you have questions about this lecture, or any of the others in the Good Answer series, you may direct them to me, Dr. Jerry C. Four, at yahoo.com.